Good morning. Thank you for being here. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to work to address you. Today we will be talking about Mac OS X forensics. So to me this is kind of a hobby what I do. I also I am also a collector. I am also and so I was I'm also following a master's course. So I will be finishing in six months, but I have quite a lot of good information right now. So it is very important that everything that we will take a look at can be downloaded. You can make download unitary test. For instance, if I create a specific evidence and I really want to extract it to retrieve it, so you have the way, the pathway to follow. And then, well, everything that I'm going to tell you, it's part of a PLASO project. Well, this is a um, Finnish name. He is uh, Plaso. It is Plaso does an execution on an image on a hard drive. It tells me about the partitions of the hard drive. And I said, this partition, I wanted to patch it. I wanted to take out all the evidences in that partition. And then it accesses it automatically. It is not on Perl, where I have to take the evidence uh, and then pass it on. No, this one is automatic. Very important, there are two libraries for the encryption, there are for Hojin, a person who is working on the PLASO project, and they will be included in PLASO recent next, so that we can work on encrypted partitions, both on Linux and on Windows. So you know those are very important when we work with software that work on forensic, you have to, you know, for instance, in Spain, GMT plus one or Eastern Coast on the US plus so knows that automatically, therefore you don't need to tell it about the time zone. So plus uh, shows evidence at the level of files, also evidence about OS, VT, jobs, register, Linux, and in case of Macintosh, this is what I'm working on now. It is also it is also supported on Android and also um, Lux uh, engines. When you access to OmniFrame, it gives you all the information. We also have Sky services, a bit of everything. Well, I have left like two lines for you to see how we will use it. This is Plaso the program that we used, we wanted to give it the same name, and then we tell him, tell me about the partitions of the hard drive. Only with those two lines, okay, you go for coffee, when you come back, you have the results. So it saves quite a lot of time. It also have console interface, a graphic one. The first one is from Plaso, and the other one is from Elasticsearch. And now I tell, well, today, well, we will be talk about the HFS file system, and then we will go into the OS very roughly, and then we will go into applications. I really wanted to focus on what we have on micro Mac uh, OS X. And that's where I focused my work on, because I didn't really want to use Apple binaries, because it is a bit of a stupid thing. I really want to see how it is being elaborated, how it's being saved, whether I really want to understand the structure, to understand all the possible flows. So this is Mac OX, so don't get really scared. So here I want to tell you this is the kernel for much underneath and then that is under C, and then you have key for drivers, which is a C++ embedded one, and that makes up a kernel, monolithic one. And then that together with a number of applications make up the drawing, which is a core. This is open source. Everything that is on top of that, no, you cannot access. Mac OX was something that everyone was looking for, so we have to give support to MacOS 8, MacOS 9. Well, for Mac OS support, we have Cocoa. So many things are mixed here. As a result of that, well, the uh, source code is not accessible. We have uh, structures in Andean. 
so we have two bytes if we want to uh, record the seven it will be zero seven zero seven when you work with exploiting well you have to include little indian so depending on the evidence you will work on one thing or another then regarding texts you can find them in nasty in utf 16 utf 8 and then time stamp it works on four different type of stamps for different ways to read it. It may be stored in HF1, 111, 1904, UTC, then Epoch, which is from 1970, and COCOA from 11, 2001. UTC, always absolute zero time. And then Mac Ox uh, adjusts that according to the time zone where you are. And then the text is human readable or syslog type. Syslog is a bit of uh, crazy. So sometimes that poses problems thanks to Macintosh. Macintosh uses HDF and we have the timestamp where the file was created. You can use that as a reference because in Linux XX we do not have the, the date of the creation of the files, only when the files was eliminated. In this case, you choose the file and you said, okay, please tell me when it was created. And then you understand that this is the syslog. So it's March, so we have a syslog from December. Where what is the, the, the date? What, it dates back to when? So time stop. For HFS, we take away seconds, and for COCOA, we sum, we add seconds. And then, well, now table of contents, the structure of my presentation. So MacOX is a bit special in terms of evidences, and I found that it was interesting to discuss that with you. Right, first of all, I take my my thing and then I do I dismount it and I copy it. This is difficult because we have to set up the Macintosh. You have to start it. So read boldly uh, start loading up the minimum possible, but you really need to trust Mau Mac OGX to be up. Uh, to, run, to be running well, but that could have lots of security problem. Then, by default, Mac X does not write on default X. Therefore, if you really want to set up or to boost the system in that mode, you really need to have an external drive on HF, HSF+. Plus. Mac X does not have a netcap, so the best way to do is to boost it with CD Linux, I always work with a Helix version from 2009. So you have to have the latest kernel version for Linux. Another important point, if we use hard, a solid state hard disk, well, they have ring. That means that I have to write on them. So solid state writing is slower. So it does two runs. So so that's the first run uh, for files that have not been assigned. So if a solid state drive, so I will not be getting the same hash, even if the drive is in a perfect condition. So when it starts to get electricity, the hard drive, it starts to modify the hard drive. So some tools over, over sometimes they do a hash to check that what I wrote before is correct. If I don't do that, sometimes it will fail because sometimes I will copy it, it will write it, and then what we will find out will be different. And if someone reproduces that case, we'll not be able to come out with the same hash. So the person says, okay, I do this partition, I do a hash tree on that partition, and that's the only way for me to say that this has not been modified because if I do a hash on the image, on the hard drive, it will change it, it will change it. And then partitions on Mac OS. Well, here I want to say that forensic tools works with the minimum unit of a file system, which is a sector. A sector in HFSF are 112 bytes. That means that when I am working at the level of utilities requiring my, me working on bytes, I have to multiply it by 512. Why? Because MNLs will tell me th all the partitions, and it will tell me where the sector starts. So these sectors are sectors, they are not bytes. However, mount will force me to tell me the bytes. That's why I multiply it by 112. And then it says, okay, this sector is 112. And here I have set a light. 
a lie. So loop is from line. So if I want to use macOS to set up a mount, I have to use a tool which is HDL useful and to tell it that it is a raw image. I have to create a device. If I try to use the macOS one, that does not exist. The second one, the offset, if I run it on um, disk image, it will fail because it requires more information. What do we have to do? Well, we have to use K parts. It creates partitions in the hard drive and then I can mount from that point. And that's, I included this uh, slide for you to see the max kernel, which is the core. It is not mat, it's X-U-N. Well, I refer to it as k -mart. And what happens if we use file vault 2? This is an encryption of an encryption in macOS. Well, one of the people who is working with me on Plaso project, he implements a library to do this. And the only thing that we have to do is that any image of macOS has a partition which is known as recovery. We have to extract the file, which is the one that appears there, encrypted root. That's the name of the file. How do I extract it? That's an ls and you only need to do to mount the partition and go and say find this file and then it tells me they know what that file is and then i extract it and then with that and with the password which is the minus p option or with a cake that is left whenever you do the encrypted partition that is to say like four letters that uh, and then f six letter you can do that by using this library leave fbd library when you mount it with dd you may extract the partition and then you can work with that partition right away or to mount it directly all right this is a screenshot i do a uml and i say well this is encrypted and then uh, uh, encrypted and then i uh, do an FBDE, and then it says the node is in 180 and extract the file, I recover it, and I pass it on to mount it. Well, the password was ABCD, and then I, it mounts it for me. I did a mount, plus, and then removing the writing option, now it's said to be also more secure, and now I can work with that partition that is encrypted. Now, evidences. Apple system log it has to always been there. The only different this time from Mac, well, the version is 10.4, and then it implements a binary format. So I do not write on text format anymore. I only use the binary format. What happens? Well, no one knew how this works. Well, there are some programs such as Encase that do that for you, but there is no official document that tells you that. Well, you find it in private var log ASL, and the format of the file is the creation date and then the user. That is to say, the people who has a permit or an authorization to read it. This is the binary, big Indian full-time stamp, and then it has a header that tells me about the first entry and the last entry. And then, well, we have a twisted or double list. Well, because I may get the header from the header, I may want to go to the last entry or I may want to go to the top entry. And that is the command. This, you can get it through a, a, a tool provided by Apple. So this is the header, very, very important here. So that's where you find them. So I point to the middle of the entry, not to the start of the entry. Why do I do that? Well, because at the beginning or the start of the entry, you have the dynamic part. So the top part is the dynamic part. That is to say the log of the text. And I don't know how big it will be. So Apple. That's it, like that. I have two bytes, and then it tells me the amount that I will be reading. Also very, very important, the entries finish in double zero. So if I have a 20-character text, 21 bytes, text, zero, zero. So that's the way it identifies it. Then the static part. Oh, don't get really scared. OK, this is a summary. So that's where the cursor points at. Next entry, message identifier, priority, 
user, the group that has been generated, the timestamp, and I have something which is the read. Well, this tells Apple, or oh, this file that you will be creating, please create it with these permits. Does it mean that only these people could read it? Yes, but because of the permits, not because of the ASL. If I do a route and I change the uh, permits, I could read it. I will be able to read it. Also very important, if I do four pointers of four bytes, so this is always the host who did it, the sender, and then in that order. And from there, then it may measure pairs of two fields of eight bytes each. Why pairs? I knew that the fourth field of eight bytes, well, the fourth field is always the message. So for instance, if I said, I don't really want to go into the message, I want it to be readable. I can create those additional entries, but I don't know the name. I knew it was the fourth message because it was the fourth one. So they use one to indicate the name of the field and then another one to use the value of the field. And why eight bytes? Because it is a pointer. Because PM pointers are always fixed. When I say fixed, it means if it, it has a value of 10,000, that is the value. They are not relative, they are absolute. If the text for some reason would be below or lower than six characters, instead of using a pointer pointing to the dynamic position of the entry when I tell you how many uh, characters I will read, it will put it right away to the eight bytes point. Then the top part of that bit will be one zero zero zero, so that tells me that that is a text, then the number of characters, that is to say the bottom part of it, and then six characters. Why six if I have seven spaces? Because it has to finish it always, it has finished always in zero, zero. And the last eight byte field, it is the point of the previous entry. So with all that, when it comes to read it, well, when it comes to forensic, can a person remove a binary entry? Yes, you can remove it as easy as eliminating a process in a routing. So the previous entry points to the next one, and the next entry does not point to the previous one, but to two, uh, uh, two positions up. So that is a bit of a problem, because you will see like a bit with some zeros. So that tells me that someone has eliminated that. So the, if you eliminate that entry, all the entries below that, if I have eliminated 50 bytes, every, all of them below that, I will have to change to all the pointers. I will have to subtract 50, because these are absolute positions. And I'm not only talking about the pointer that pointing to the previous entry to the next one, but the pointer pointing at information. These eight byte fields, uh, the four eight byte fields that I created, you would also have to do that with that. It's takes time, but you can do it. So this is the way you would do it, okay? Well, I'm sure you cannot really read anything in here. Well, but you may take your time to read it at home. Well, evidences. Well, all the evidences from applications. Also very important, UTMP, WTMP, they are on the binary format, on the ASL. We are not going to find that on Macintosh. We also have errors, connections. Well, USB uh, mounted, devices, manufacturer and model, exactly the same as Linux. I'm looking for an USB MSC entry in ASL, and then I uh, will just get all the uh, USB that have been mounted. So these are very important, as same as AISF in terms of evidences. ASL, BSD, binary. Well, I told you that sometimes there are the exceptions. Apple uses this format. Well, it's exactly the same as Linux. However, there is an exception. This is a multi-line message. So therefore, second restriction, so to speak. Well, we have a repeated line. So I do an entry. So if the next one is exactly the same, it conserves or keeps the time entry. So it updates the time. And so at the end of the day, I only know the first time and the last time that that entry was repeated, contrary to what happens with the binary system. So these are the most frequent ones. This is an own format. We have the firewall formats. So did I allow going coming out of this or exiting this application or not? And then we have the security TID for certificates, for stored passwords, etc. Not only ASL, there are any uh, more uh, applications out there. Some of them create their own log, etc. And then we need something to root that, to rotate that. 
and then often we do that out of uh, space reasons. I have to discuss Wi-Fi dot log. We have all the information about the Wi-Fi connection, when we logged in or not. If we do a log connection, we keep it. So it stores all that information. So that is quite important. Also very important. Well, this works with five megabytes. The rotor is done on, f the rotation is done on five megabytes. How long does it take? Well, it depends on how long you use the Wi-Fi, but it takes one or two months. Well, the last format, human file format, is a new format. It's interesting because you execute it well. The application creates it when it boosts, when it is booted, and then it is rotated when you boost it again, when you start the setting. So the log will be there for 10 days. No one will rotate it. So that could be that log could be a problem for Macintosh because it will increase uh, in size, in size, in size, and no one will rotate it up until you boost the computer again. So this is a this on Plaxo. Well, when I do Plaxo, I upload them. Christian corrects that. When it is corrected, when he gives us the go ahead, then it's sent out to pro pro production. So you may download that already. You may try it. UTMPX. So it is exactly the same as that of Linux. Well, the structures, shame, it's a little Indian. Well, the previous one was big in Indian. This one is little Indian, so different order. And it includes the sessions, the sessions that took place in the system. And then it tells us about the status, whether it is active, inactive, etc. So that is the directory. It is very important to copy it. You have to copy it. Otherwise, it will tell you that the users are inactive because it closes the consoles one after another. So it is very important for you to copy it when it comes to an intrusion, a case of intrusion. You copy it and you work on it. Because if you switch off the computer, it tells you that the uh, users have switched off or logged out. So this is the status tells me whether the user is active or inactive. Linux, well, Linux does that on 9. Mac OS does that in 12 when I boost the computer for whatever reason, because it has been suspended or whatever, it inserts a user and UTMPX user. And so this is the signature. And then the boot map uh, entry. So that's the way one of these the UTMPX files are started. And then the host, whether it has been connected, whether there's the, the terminal, the browser, the user, very, very important. The time, the time when I started the system. If it is seven, type seven will tell me that it has access, access the system and it, whether it is active or whether it is I access the system, but it is not active or is inactive. So the entry structure for you this. Well, the status, you see big star next to it. So this is like two byte one. When you look at the source code, it's sort type. But when you look at the physical evidence, that's an either integer system. So zero, 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 that's an integer. So we have implemented it, that's four bytes. So two bytes, well, four bytes is huge. So I took two bytes, as the documentation said, and I put two bytes. So you can see that in green. So if you want to patch it yourself and follow the documentation, well, well, what you get on the documentation is not what you get on the evidence. Basic security mode module created by Solaris to offer a level of security by the uh, government of the United States, McAfee gave it to Apple, Apple um, put it in open source. So people are maintaining it on open trust. You may access to that site, a source code. It is quite interesting. It is in, in a pre audit phase. So the time is in April, you will see numbers. And it is very important to do well to take a look at the evidence if you work with malware. So this works at the level of the audit works at the level of the kernel. How does this work? BMS file has 
one or more entries. And these are binary structures. So in the case of the one used by Apple, there are four binary structures. And then you ha that those have to be recognized. How does it work? There is always a giga uh, header, which is mandatory, that gives me an ID, which is the type of entry that will be generic, gives me the time stamp and the size. And Apple, even if the documentation does not say it, and even if it is not mandatory, it gives me the token. It says, well, uh, I executed it well, didn't have any problem. And timestamp is just a signature. It's repetition. Tells me about the size of the entry. This is the way it works. An identifier tells me what it is. Header. These are all the structures that I have implemented. The four, 40 ones. And then a struct trailer. Token trailer and token return. These are not mandatory. Well, Solaris changes a bit. So Solaris has more uh, structures, but these are like Solaris touches. So do not get scared. Well, this is a BMS file. You get an entry on the top, and then we have like five touches. Well, the first one tells me about well, the header for the entry, then the subject, who did it, the ID, the user, the group, text. This is a type of text. And then the f how it finishes, OK, how it ends, and then the trailer, the f finishing or the end trailer. Right, keychain. What is that? That's where Apple keeps all the, or stores all the passwords. When you, I don't know, for instance, when you, well, it stores all the passwords. The password and the secret note are encrypted, but where you kept the password, the user that you used, where you kept it, whether you changed your protocol, you full URL. All that on flat text. If you know how to read it, that is a binary structure. Okay, that appears on flat text. How do you read that? This is Big Endian. We have one made by the system and one made by each user. Also very important. That is stored on tables. Tables have some kind of record. We are interested in the application record and the internet record. What is an application record? A Wi-Fi is a, it's a type of application. Secret node is a type of application. What is an internet application, the second group? Email. So if you have a Chrome or email, it will be stored on the internet record. And then Glasso, okay, this is the keychain. This is the way you read it. You read the header that tells you where the schema is. Schema tells you where the, off the offsets of the table are. They are relative where the schema starts. So if the offset is 50, it is on byte 62. When I jumped into the table, the table tells me the number of records that I will be having, where the record starts. This is, the offset is relative to the table, and then we will tell me the type. Then I check out the types, and then when I get a type for this application or internet record, and record, as I say, they go when they follow each other. So there is a header that tells me about the size of the record. And I can access that information. I know how to read it. And because it is on flat text, I get all the information. These are the two existing cases, OK, the application and the internet one. We always have a header. SSGP, that's the cipher data where the passwords are stored. And then the header are four byte fields that points at relative positions from that record plus one. So that is to say. So if I go to a header, one of the fields of the header tells me that it is 51, I'm going to jump the 15 because it always adds one. I don't know why. In the past, it was relative. Now, for some reason, it adds its plus one. So please take it into account. If it says 51, it is 50. OK? So now you know where everything is, all these pointers pointing at information. I know whether it will be text info or port info or, for instance, if it is text type, it will go and tell me, you will read 50 characters, and these will be the 50 characters. And then from there, I don't need any other um, application to move on. 
And then you will go and say, what about the passwords? How does it work? For instance, the user accounts, I have my user, my password. And then in the bottom part of the keychain, I have stored the password of the database, a password of the user. And then from there, it starts to decipher all that. What algorithm does it use? Triple Ds and SBC. The next one, well, this is lighter. So whenever we store a file, macOS does a file. So it tells me that I've copied that. Well, no, before that, it is unique for each of the volumes. So if I have an external drive, it will create this structure in the document versions. Why did I put document versions? Well, because Apple refers to it as version. Uh, and others say document revisions. So it's a mix of them both. Okay, it tells me where the files have been stored. Well, it tells me about the date of the copy, the path of the original file, where the file, the copy has been stored, and who did it. And this is the SQL sequence. Okay, I'm finishing. Cops. It's very important, especially when there are information leaks. So whether this person has taken the information from USB or whether the person has printed out something. If we use a remote printer, we will know that it is big endian time stamp in e on epoch. So it uses 2.0. I use RFC which is very easy and simple to understand. RFC identifies six types of data. So one of those is, well, Apple does not use date, uh, date type, okay? It uses integers. So where is that uh, stored? Private var spool cups. Well, the first one, well, you know, each work, well, it makes a copy of each work. We know the name of the user, the full name of the user, the application, timestamp. We know when the file was sent out to processing, when processing was over. Well, we know everything but the, the, the what file we are talking about. That's the flow of it. I know that someone has printed out a PDF document. I can go to the printer and gain access to that file. Well, if I... Well, if we use the remote application for remote printing, it does a copy of the document that I printed out. Okay, and then it says, okay, it adds the C before the name. And CAPS IPP, it uses an identifier. So, so you see here an example para Boolean, for Boolean and for text. The name will be a number, the number of characters that I will be reading plus the type. That is to say the information that is stored. For instance, if I want to know when it was printed and if it was printed, I will have seven characters. Uh, and the name is, when was the last time that you did the printing? So this identifier will be integer type. In this case, would be 20, 21, or whatever. And then from there, I can work with this binary information, binary files, and I can retrieve or extract information. So you can have the information about when it was processed, the number of copies. So this is information used by Apple. Some of them are Apple exclusive. All right, and the last one, please. There are many other libra many libraries working on lists. Well, these are can they are like the these are like the register of Windows. Please maybe on Excel ML or on binary format. The problem with P list is that the, the, some people see them as a basic structure where I keep information, where I store information, booleans, etc. Something very simple, plain structure, binary structure. This is not true. This is and un correct, we will find P list files, you know, with attributes about other P list files. I've seen like three different levels, you know, P list containing P list files. 
the problems are libraries. Xcode only works at one level. If one open one of these files and I have only one P list, it will show it to me in binary formats. And then frameworks of Mac OS. We do not have access to the code. Sometimes it keeps attributes in the binary format of uh, of itself, okay? Sometimes it looks simple, but it, at the end of the day, it's not that simple. So let us start off with the first one. Users, uh, system users, basic type of storing it, you know. And then we have two fields, policy, password policy, XML within another XML, binary in nature. Well, it tells us last time the password was changed, last time someone logged in into the system, how many failed logins, very, very important. Apple does resetting. So if I do one million attacks, you know, it will tell me when I did it and how many times I did it. And then if someone access to the system, it will just set it to zero based on this system, okay? This system will set it to zero. And then another structure. This is a binary P list structure, which is the shadow hash data. It is uh, for to deviate keys. Tells you about the number of introductions and then uh, and then the hash. This algorithm is not slow. If you include a number of interactions of 37,000, that is to say, repeat the algorithm 37,000 times, it becomes a bit slow. So there are two tools, well, 15 passwords per second, or from 15 to 35 on i7. So it is a bit small. So if you use hash, you see, well, dollar symbol, hash, sim dollar symbol, hash, but it only takes the 127 first characters. Also very important, the 32 bytes, I reported it because it had a flow. The only one that works is the 61, 64 bytes. Well, one of the developers told me that 048 will be reviewed, will be revised. The same happens with other algorithms, with the other two algorithms. If you see a flow in the 32-bit algorithm, that please wait because they will change it, they will revise it. It is very, well, it's slow, but you may do self-login, auto-login. So that is to say that you don't have to enter the password. So it keeps the password on ETC, key C password. So or by doing XOR on a magic key. So this file is also accessible you can try it. I said, well, if I cannot retrieve the password, I want to check whether I have uh, checked or, or enabled the auto-logging user. So, Time Machine and Bluetooth, well, we have the historical data for them both. It always keeps the last time that I log in the system. Oh, I forgot to tell you that PList work on COCOA 2001. If you use libraries that do the all the patching, if it is on zero, it will give us back zero, one, 2001. So this is the structure, backup alias. This is a binary structure, as I mentioned before. Well, byte 11 includes the size of, uh, of the text that we are reading, and this is the name that we give to the hard drive on Time Machine. Then uh, updates, it stores the list of updates, and then also wireless and Wi-Fi tells us the last time that we're logging on, on Wi-Fi. And then, well, it doesn't tell us about the password because the password is in a different channel. And this one hasn't got the timestamp, but it is important because it tells us about the rules for configuration of firewall. Spotlight, which is the magnifying lenses that appears on top of Apple, and then I enter a term, and then it tells me where that term appears. Okay, it tells me the last time I entered a term and what was the reference. Then the historical, about the number of uh, applications stored, and then Apple accounts. Well, for those of you who use them, well, it gives you all the information. Well, all that is supported on Plaso. You can have access to the source code. And then more P lists. 
So this is the MRB on Windows. This is the last time that I opened the file. So for instance, UFL, if I want to know the last files that I used, I use the framework LSS. This is a plist file binary. And I have two names, the number of the file and the binary structure. No one knows how to patch it. So this ha includes the full path, the list of in nodes. So that is to say where the file was. It also tells me whether it was mounted on an external drive or not. So it tells me about the original drive where the application was released. Lots of information here. Also very important, for instance, if I opened a file which name was X, I move it to a different directory and I call it B, Apple does not update. The only thing that Macbook Macintosh updated is the in node, in node. And then, well, this is the structure. So this field is not a plain field, and it's not an easy field. So this is uh, an example of M player, MP, M player. So it tells us that the file was open on a volume. So it is an external drive. It tells us the sandbox. So these are the cows of the spanker, okay? I'm finishing. Sidebar now. If we use the finder, so all the configuration that appears on the left, all that is stored in a single place. Why is that important? Every time you mount a dis device, it keeps all the information. First, that information is stored on HFS. If the partition is FSS, and if, if only beef, if B partition is DMG, so it keeps those historical data. What is the problem? 10.9 does not store the register of DMG, okay? So this is an example from POC alias P. So this is the timestamp of when I formatted the image. This is the root, films, NTNFs. So it doesn't tell me about the time. Okay, it says 19.04, this is zero time. So Sarah 2, and then Wireshark is an MG, DMG file. So this is the image of 10.8 updated to 10.9. So if I had a 10.9, it didn't tell me, it wouldn't tell me where I mounted the DMG. So also, also very important, DS store, which is used by Finder to find out about the configuration that we have chosen. Well, you know, everyone hates this file, but Finder implemented something very interesting. So when you store a, a file, you can recover it. In the past, if you deleted a file, you had to go to the thrash and you could recover it but Finder didn't know where it was stored. But now it is stored on DS store. If I recover the file, I recover it, and then it, DS store f deletes it. But after some time, if I empty the thrash, I'll go and say, well, it uh, deletes the file, but DS store does not delete the file. So for instance, if I know or have an intrusion case and if I know that someone or suspect that someone is doing something, it is very important to go to the trash point of the home and copy, copy the DS store because the DS store is very likely to keep the latest files that have been stored. Well, documentation says that this is not true, but well, I had my computer running for one day and at the end of the day, deletes the file. If you delete the file and it takes some time to empty the thrash, it takes a few hours to clean it. So if you do not restart the computer, it also deletes itself. So this is important to copy DS store for live evidence. Uh, how are we doing with time? Well, okay, I have a demo. It is, well, it goes fast. Eh? Would you like to see it?
Bueno, la tengo aquí mejor, más rápido. Bueno, eh, esto, ¿se ve algo o no? Bien. Ah, ya aparece por aquí. Hostia, pues yo no veo nada. Bueno, voy a intentar hacerlo. Bueno, eh, como veis, es en malware.out. Eh, malware so you can see malware.out. Well, often it is a 40 gigas image. Well, to do that here, we will need 11 hours. But I would like you to see the results. Okay, this is what he has patched. I said, execute only one line. Then I went to syslog utmpx. So we have it all. If we also have Chrome entries, Skype entries. I have a link that tells me you have visited this website. This tells me that I uh, retrieved this file. The UTMPX, it tells me that I just logged in as a new user. So it tells me about all the files that I deleted. So all the evidence, all the evidence for all the files, all together and arranged in, arranged in order. So I can attack that image by doing uh, ESC consultations, etc. Oh, the problem is that this is too dark. OK, now I'll show you a simpler example so that you can see this uh, file, okay? So it will look nicer, okay? It's loaded in a different, okay, so different uploading. Oh, no. This not is not any better. Anyway, I'm trying it. Okay, so so this is the time per stamp timeline. So it finishes here. Can you see it? Should finish in the rooted because I prepared it for rooted. So you see all the evidences because I created the image here for rooted. So you can see evidence here, this little box here. Below, you see all number of evidences. If I call, so please give me the BMS, the ISLs. So all the UTMPXs. Okay, here we go. So I don't want it to have this uh, restriction. I want it to be in syslog. BMS. So we are adding all the evidences. I can use chains. I could do whatever. I could do ciphering by text. I may use teaser. And here we will have all the entries. So these are the logs. You may patch them, you may access because all the information has been extracted. Well, some of you would say, I prefer the console. So if you prefer the console, give me a sec. I'll show you something. Okay, give me a sec. So I can do an SQL sentence. And I say, okay, I want this value to contain this. I can say, okay, the date I want it to go from here to here. From, all right, so it starts to 
upload all the information, to download all the information, the date. Then I start to see the evidence. I can say, okay, show me only these parts, this and that. So at the end of the day, is to have Mac OS files, evidences, class applications, to have it all together in a log and to be able to parse it. So these are all the logs and then I can work on it. That depends on the ability of the forensic person. Because sometimes, you know, I am, uh, you know, I waste lots of time, you know, because what of different type of stamp, it works for Windows, for Macintosh, for Linux, okay, we are trying to improve. If you want to join our projects, I would encourage you to do it because you can learn a lot. Questions? Is it that bad or not? Hola, buenos días. Felicidades por. Congratulations for your presentation. Well, if I'm not mistaken, you said that this is part of your uh, dissertation, okay? Or so when you will be presenting your PhD, will you publish it so that we can digest this information better and well, well to take our time? So this is wonderful, you know, as a way of introduction, but actually I couldn't really, um, you know, even if you were to repeat it, I wouldn't be able to work with 10% of it. Will you publish it so that we can take our time to learn from it? Yes, I understand perfectly all right. Yes, I was kind of expecting that. I am the author. I will publish it in September. Yes, and we will publish it from the University of London. Yes, uh, we will publish it, you know, we will explain it perfectly all right. You know, we will include every single clarification that you may need. And as I said, this is a free coding. It is... Um, project which is maintained under Google, but it is free code, and you can see how it's being implemented. So you have my email address, my Twitter address. If you want to join our project, please just let us know. Any other questions? Hello. Actually, I am, I, I don't know whether I'm afraid or, 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 or impressed, you know, with all the information that macOS uh, stores. Does macOS actually need to store so much information for the day-to-day -day work, or it is for X person or X entity or X whatever follows, you know, and can track and trace everything that you do and store on your computer? Well, it's the same as any other OS. It's well, Windows stores exactly the same, Linux stores is exactly the same. It depends on the level of your configuration. So if I had configured that on a Linux setting, I would have gotten the same information. Is it necessary? Not always. But if you are a system administration, you really want to know what had happened in the, super, in the, in the system, but the more information, the better. Well, sometimes, you know, XOR, you know, storing, uh, passwords or keychain when the password is ciphered. Well, perhaps you wouldn't need as much information, but it could help you out, if you know what I mean. Me, as a system administrator, I prefer to have as much information as possible, always. If you cipher that hard drive, you shouldn't have any problems. Well, you supposedly, okay? If the password is not difficult to find out or to guess. I can't really tell you whether it is necessary or not to have the information. Sometimes some of that information is easy. For instance, things about secure information about BSM, you know, you really need that. I don't belong to Apple or anything. I'm not affiliated. I'm not getting any money from them. I hope I have, I have answered your question. Any other questions? Yeah. 